Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast, where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Ivan. And I'm Ivan the Provocateur. And, uh, well, Cam, I, I think we're about to enter some sort of strange zone. Can you Can you tell me what it is? Yes, we are going to enter the Xander Zone this week with the 2002 breakout hit, Triple X, starring Vin Diesel. Frankly, I live for this shit. <laughs> Scott, stop thinking like Prague Police and start thinking PlayStation. <laughs> I'll grab my, uh, what's that, video camera rocket launcher and get right to it. Mm -hmm, that's right. I don't play this game. I don't play this game. <laughs> There's so many quotable <laughs> lines from this film. It's ridiculous. Um, yeah. Which is actually quite interesting because we're speaking to the writer of the film later this week, uh, Mr. Rich Wilkes, and that was a really good interview. So I'm looking forward to everyone hearing that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a ton of fun. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he takes Cam to task, so uh, <laughs> tune in for that one, folks. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to read the Letterbox.com synopsis. But this film has a bit of a strange place in my history, so we'll get to that in a second. A new breed of secret agent, Xander Cage is your standard adrenaline junkie with no fear and a lousy attitude when the u.s government recruits him to go on a mission he's not exactly thrilled his mission to gather information on an organization that may just be planning the destruction of the world led by the nihilist yorgi it's kind of a weird way to end it with just this the nihilist yorgi as if like the average person reading a letterbox synopsis would know who that is. It's like you would underline your game, like, and, and it's supposed to strike fear, like saying Blofeld or Khan. Yeah, yeah. Or if you'd said Goldfinger, people would go, oh, well, it is in the title. That does mean something. Yorgi, that's a bit of a stretch, but I, it, you know what? That does sum up the movie. I guess he's like our missing co-host. You've got Cam the Provocateur and Yorgi the Nihilist. Yeah, yeah, that's true. We need to find a third. Yeah. Oh, good old Yorgi. But, um... I, I've got some stories about this film, but for you, Cam, this came out in 2002. What's your memory of it? I was about 63 at this point. Uh -huh. So, um, <laughs> no, this was actually falling right at a very, um, I mean, I was 21 when this came out. So I was right in the pocket for Triple X, <laughs> the movie. And um, I remember <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember that. Don't Google this film, guys. Don't Google <laughs> this film. Your search history will just destroy itself. It's 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 terrible. It was very difficult to do research this week. <laughs> or very easy, but you got sidetracked. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I remember, you know, I don't have a lot of stories about leading up to movies, like the anticipation, the excitement, but this one really does jump out to me. I remember for my friend Mark's 21st birthday, his girlfriend had rented a limo and a bunch of us had all you know, we're going to be driving around the town in the limo and going to restaurants and stuff like that that night. And I remember two of the girls in the limo could not stop talking about how much they were looking forward to Triple X. And I remember one of them in particular was quite taken with Vin Diesel at this point in time and was just fawning over him. And I think we were all kind of on the same wavelength that Vin Diesel, I had really come to appreciate him in the movie Pitch Black. And then, of course, you know, I'd seen him in Saving Private Ryan, of course, and a couple other things. Um, and so he was just, you know, primed to explode. This is just coming, you know, a year after Fast and the Furious. So it was, for me, also something I was looking forward to because of the fact it was Vin Diesel in a big action movie that's clearly riffing off James Bond, which is another love of mine. So, yeah, that one night in that limo, there was a lot of talk about Triple X. I mean, you heard the girls talking and you immediately turned around and went, bitches, come. <laughs> and then that's when they threw you out the limo and that was the end of your night. Yeah, I, I appreciate the line in this movie. It's obviously a RoboCop reference to the uh, villain played by Kurtwood Smith in that movie. But uh, yeah, um, I don't think it would have worked out great for me that night. <laughs> if you'd stayed in the limo, you would have all ended up with matching XXX tattoos, though, to be fair. Well, I mean, yeah, I was the only one who got one, so no one matched mine. Mm. Um, as for me, I was also, I suppose, right in the pocket. I was 15 when this came out, and I was very much into my, you know, new metal, rock, heavy metal. And the soundtrack for this really grabbed me, and it was in the trailer as well. I think one of the trailers had Drowning Pool 
uh, Bodies, which is in the film. And that's like one of my favorite songs from that era. So I was instantly taken with it. Um, I, I had also seen, I think Fast and the Furious had been out by this point. Yep. And I liked that. I hadn't seen Pitch Black or I, I had seen Pri- Saving Private Ryan, but I don't really remember Vin Diesel in it that much. Yeah, he's a smaller supporting character. Um, I believe he's the first fatality of the group, too. Right. Okay. That's probably why I don't remember him too much. But yeah, I, I was excited by the trailers and the marketing, and I definitely saw it in, in theaters, and I, I think I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, I did see it in theaters as well. Uh, I remember just walking out fine with it. Like, I enjoyed it in parts. It had some stunts I really enjoyed, but it wasn't one that, like, I guess loomed large in my young memories going forward, but... I don't think any of us walked out of it without, you know, having a unpleasant experience. The one thing I say in terms of my stories with the film is with the letter X, because I was at that point in love with everything that was extreme. Okay. Okay. So I liked my X games. I liked my Hardy Boys with a Z. They were Team Extreme, not EX, but Extreme. So there was a film called Triple X. Like it had to have me. I went as far as having an email address that spelled Extreme with an X instead of an EX. So I was very much uh, uh, the target audience. Yeah, there was a lot of Xs at this point, weren't there? Because you had the X Files, you had the X Men movies had kicked off in the year two thousand. Uh, and obviously X-Men had been around since the 60s, but this was the real, you know, pop culture crossover of the X-Men. Um, you also had the band Static X um, really emerging in 99. So, yeah, a lot of X's being tossed around in this uh, point in time. Yeah, it makes you wonder where they got the idea from. I don't know. Where did they? <laughs> well, luckily, we uh, take that question to the man who uh, came up with the character himself later this week. So we'll, we'll skip to that. But Cam, I need all of this in me right now. How was this film made? <laughs> so it started as a uh, you know a pitch from Rich Wilkes, the writer who we'll talk about later in this week, and I'm going to leave sort of the development of the screenplay for him to talk about later in the week because uh, he can sum it up far, far, far better than I ever could in my wildest dreams. But he was a writer who had worked on some movies like Airheads, The Jerky Boys. He was also the writer director of a early Ben Affleck starring film called Glory Days, and that's D A Z E or Z-E, depending on which pronunciation you prefer. Um, they spell it D-A-Z-E? Yeah. Oh, as in dazed. Oh, yeah, duh. Yeah, <laughs> <What the yeah>. fuck? <laughs> uh, So he had pitched this idea of essentially, you know, what happens if you make a spy adventure, like in the James Bond mold, with like a young spy and really tap into youth culture. And... This was being run um, through Revolution Studios, who was a fairly new studio at the time. It was headed by Joe Roth, who had been a former um, Disney exec. And early on, they were really looking to target youth markets. A lot of like raunchy comedies, and this is obviously moving more into the action realm. But they wanted to be, I think, fairly appealing to young people. They did have a big hit with Black Hawk Down, the Ridley Scott movie, which maybe isn't necessarily as much in that mold, but gave them a certain amount of juice just in terms of green lighting expensive productions so they bring in director rob cohen and he had done the fast and the furious and he received this script three weeks before fast and the furious opened so it made a lot of sense for him to jump over and he would be jumping over to this film with the fast and the furious producer neil moritz and he wanted to um cast diesel in the role now It seems that um, originally the lead role in this film was not uh, offered to Vin Diesel. It was actually, there was another actor they were looking at who turned it down. And that actor, I think, is also someone who speaks very strongly to the youth culture of that time. It was what all of the 20-year-olds were screaming in the streets out for, Eric Banya. I, I had so many names in my head, and Eric Banya was the last of person I could think of it comes to youth culture. Eric Banya is awesome. But yeah, I don't think he's the draw for 20 year olds the way that Vin Diesel was. And it was very important to Rob Cohen to get him in there. He really fought for him because he said, what Sean was to the 60s, Vin is to the 2000s. In the Kennedy era, Sean was the image of masculinity, charm, vulnerability, and sexiness. Vin represents that for this whole new millennium. I... I don't think I've ever seen any charm from Vin Diesel, unless he's a CGI tree. Mm, well, the uh, the girls who were in that limo that night 
They would disagree with you, Scott. I, I don't think they want to be charmed by Vin Diesel. <laughs> well, I'll leave that up to them to determine. But um, yeah, and just a little bit of background on the director, Rob Cohen, who's fighting for Diesel. He was a guy, he started out as a producer and he'd done movies um, like The Wiz, the um, adaptation of the Broadway play. He'd also done Running Man with Schwarzenegger. Before moving into directing, he his first film was a movie called um, Small Circle of Friends in 1980, starring Karen Allen from Raiders of the Lost Ark. And he would go on to do things like Dragon the Bruce Lee Story, Dragon Heart, voiced by Sean Connery, um, Daylight, the Sylvester Stallone vehicle, and then obviously 2001's Fast and the Furious, which was his big blow up, which is what brings him over to like a major production like this. Um, and so it was very important to him. He wanted this to be focused on practical stunts. He didn't want to use heavy CG. And this is a time, you know, just this comes out the same year as Die Another Day, where you see the Bond producers trying to, I would say, work on the cutting edge with a lot of CG effects. And Triple X was looking to go a little bit of a different direction. You know, you referenced the X Games earlier. It wanted that X Games energy where you are seeing people, vibrant young people, far younger than myself now, this aging old person who can only look at youth and shed a single tear. But they wanted that sort of youth energy on the screen. And so I think um, largely practical is the way to go. Well, not to spoil my thoughts on the film, but one of the things I've written down as a positive is it feels like the money is on the screen with this film. Mm. Yeah. And I think they've invested in stunts. There's a couple of stunts in particular that I'll, I'll point out later on. But yeah, it really feels that uh, they went in the right direction, especially now looking back. This feels like a much more recent film than, say, Die Another Day. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And, um, you know, for Vin Diesel, this was like his big star moment. This was a big payday for him. It seems like upwards of 10 million was what he was getting for this film. That's at least the number thrown around online a lot. And he had a quote about um, what drew him to this. He said, The least likely of us can be heroic and be patriotic. We were very conscious of the spy films at the time, and we felt like there was a growing generation that was being underrepresented. I guess the humor and fun and taking someone from this new generation and giving them the task of being a secret agent was appealing. So I... I think everyone, you know, we're hearing really understood what the gist of this was, like what the mm -hmm. appeal should be. James Bond was feeling older at this point. So the idea of putting someone young in that slot, I think, made a lot of sense, especially as you're following The World Is Not Enough and opening the same year as Die Another Day. And you've also got a couple of things going on at the same time. I mean, firstly, they've made so many attempts to try and have an American James Bond. Yeah. And most of them have fallen flat. Uh, even now, there's been a couple of success stories, but you know, uh, f you know, um, Flint, for instance, only lasted two films, and it was diminishing returns in the second one anyway. Yeah, and at this point too, I mean, Mission Impossible is around the first two, but it was also, uh, I don't know that it was intended at that point to be this like just ongoing powerhouse franchise because tom cruise was so busy you'd get one every few years and it would be like a pretty sizable gap between mission impossible 2 and 3 i think it's like six years or something how much has there been between these this most recent fallout and then the two we're getting now um it'll be what three or four years i guess is that it well it feels like longer that's probably just coronavirus but um, the other thing as well is this is in, I mean, this comes out in 2002, which is in the shadow of, of September 11th, I should say. You know, that was a big deal in America and definitely changed a lot of outlooks and politics and what people wanted from not just cinema, but entertainment. So giving them some sort of like American role model, I think was quite important at this stage. I mean, you look at one scene in the film where they pull out the whole the spy who loved me with the, you know, the American flag parachute. They wanted that patriotism, that sense of like, hell yeah. And they needed that at that point. Yeah. And like a hero who um, maybe has uh, questionable morals early on, but has a pretty strong moral code throughout the course of the movie. He's a guy who doesn't necessarily follow the government rules, but has a pretty good heart. Which I think, it, I mean, I don't want to get political, but it kind of appeals down the middle between both sides of that when it comes to the spectrum of what people think Americans should be. It's, it's got much, it's got the home values, but he's also like an anti-establishment kind of guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was a pretty smart choice for that particular point in time. And, um, you know, Vin Diesel really threw himself into the stunts on this movie. 
he uh, was often having to be pulled back by Rob Cohen and the other, you know, producers because he wanted to do more than he was potentially able of doing. And these stunts were really dangerous. We should note that Vin Diesel's stunt double, Harry O'Connor, who did a lot of the aerial stuff in this movie, um, he was a former Navy SEAL who'd worked on aerial uh, stunts for Tomorrow Never Dies as well as Charlie's Angels. He was killed uh, working on this movie in the scene um, where he's doing the parasailing and, you know, attached to the boat. And he hit a pillar of the bridge in Prague. And uh, he did that on his second take, so they ended up using the first take and then dedicating the movie to him. I didn't notice that in the film, actually. That's that's fair enough. Um, I, I don't know whether I like the fact that they used the take. Maybe that's what the family wanted, either way. Well, if a stuntman dies, they will typically always use the good take they can. So it's kind of like unwritten stuntman code that like for example tom cruise and he wasn't killed but those the moment where he broke his leg on mission impossible um followed they used that take and so in this case they had the first take of him of this uh, act of this stuntman harry o'connor pulling the stunt off so they were going to use it yeah well, that's, that's, in that context i think it's actually quite a nice touch fair enough mm-hmm. yeah more of a tribute to him for sure mm, yeah and um, so the movie had a $70 million budget. Domestically, it did 142.1. International, 135.3. For a worldwide total of 277.4. So, uh, quite profitable. It's better than Dune. <laughs> well, yeah, it didn't have to deal with a pandemic, though, to be fair. That's true. But that, that's for a, a launch of a potential franchise and a bit of a gamble because it's a completely new character. It's not, you know, the days of uh, franchises and gambling on established IPs. I think this was, a, this was a good gamble. It paid off. Yeah, and it's just notable that this opens the same year as Die Another Day. Die Another Day did make more. It did $432 million. But its budget was $142 million, so like double um, triple X's, just over double. I imagine, you have to imagine that uh, Die Another Day did more internationally than this did, though. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Bond is huge overseas, so yes, I would say that's 100% accurate. And triple X fell at number 14 for the year at the worldwide box office, right between Austin Powers in Goldmember and Scooby-Doo. There are there's a trio of movies you wouldn't normally see, you know, wedged together. No, that's a strange one. Wait, so Austin Powers Gold Member was the last one, right? Yes. And that was out this year. I thought they went on longer than two thousand and one. Uh no. No. Wow. Okay. I always thought that in my memory the Austin Powers films were in like the early noughties. Well, this is two thousand two, this last one, but the first Austin Powers was ninety five. Wow, I was I was eight when that came out? Correction, 97, not 95. But yeah, you would have been, what, 10 then? Yeah, that, that is not how my memory works, but hey-ho. But, mm. you know, overall, a good year for the launch of a franchise. Yeah, and this was a huge year for spy movies. There was a lot of competition for who could potentially take over the crown from James Bond. Because, as I said, you had it number six, Die Another Day. So Bond still going strong. Number 13 was obviously Austin Powers. Number 19, The Bourne Identity. Number 23, Some of All Fears. Another Ben Affleck film there uh, with the Jack Ryan franchise trudging on. Number 39, Spy Kids 2, Island of Lost Dreams. Number 49, The Tuxedo with Jackie Chan. Number 69, Bad Company. Number 88, I Spy. Number 97, Undercover Brother. Number 107, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, which was George Clooney's directorial debut. Number 122, The Quiet American with Michael Caine. And number 144, Ballistic X versus Sever with Antonio Banderas. That is a big year for spy films. Wow, we're going to be coming back here several times by the sounds of it. Yeah, like, I can't remember what the other year was. There's another year we've tackled that has a ton. It might have been 2012, maybe. But uh, 2002 is just like the year that just keeps on firing them out. And I think also Men in Black 2 was this year as well, which is obviously more tangentially a spy film, but and, and not trying to take over the Bond world. But um, yeah, a lot of stuff going on in 2002. Which was the most successful spy film? Was it Dying of the Day this year? Yeah. And then was was this film second? Um, No, Austin Powers and Goldmember would have been second. This would have been third. Okay, okay. That's uh, not a bad start. 
that's that's not too bad. Okay, well, I I think I've got my fill. You've uh, you've put your gadgets inside me, but uh, what I want to do now is activate penetrator mode, and uh, <laughs> and get down to the review. Um, we both seem to have enjoyed this when we originally watched it. I've actually watched it a couple of times this year because it's come up on a couple of live videos we've done, like ranking spies and things like that in the past. But uh, it was nice to sit down and, and go through it again. But Cam, I think you may have changed your opinion. Um, I don't know that my opinion has really changed that much. Uh, Rewatching it again last night, like it's a movie that I appreciate a lot of what it's doing. The idea of injecting like youth energy into the Bond franchise. I mean, Spy Kids had obviously done it the year before, but in a much more, you know, cartoonish, kid-pleasing way. This movie, I like what it's doing. I think competition's always a good good thing. And I really do wonder if movies like this are what pushed the Bond producers to do Casino Royale, to really, you know, reframe what a Bond movie could be. And so, like, I think in terms of the stunt work in this movie, I really enjoy it. Vin Diesel is so lively in this movie. I made, like, several notes. Like, Vin Diesel just seems, like, electric in sections of this movie early on where it seems like he has so much more energy than I see him in movies now where he's often just glowering and grumbling through movies like, obviously, the later Fast and Furious, but even stuff like Bloodshot, for example. It just doesn't feel as much fun. He seems so locked in here, and... I like the way they tackle a lot of the unconventional approaches to spycraft we see his character going through. But where like, I think I struggle with it more so is, um, every time I've watched it lately, I notice like, the pace kind of really dips as the movie keeps going. And I think part of that is tied to the villain who's never worked for me, even the first time through. And I still find that, even just last night. But... I wonder, maybe it's a larger conversation we can dig into in a little bit, but it just feels like for a movie aimed at like a youth audience, it's missing that real spike of energy to keep it going through like the middle sections where a lot of it is just triple X hanging out with the bad guy with not a real clear list of objectives. It's more like, well, immerse myself in this world and wait for something to happen. I wonder if it would have been maybe a better idea to keep him very active, like the way you see him earlier on in this movie, very much being kind of that bull in a china shop. I like how he approaches the villain, just charging right into his sort of hangout in a club. Like, I'm wondering if maybe that energy was needed a little more in the second half, but there are some stun sequences I still think are phenomenal that, you know, close out the movie. So I guess I'm a mixed bag on Triple X in that it's a spy movie I can totally sit down and enjoy sections of, but it's not one that sweeps me away the way I want it to. I mean, before I get into mine, let me just address what you said. And I, I think I agree. And I think I know why it does that in the second half of the film. Mm -hmm. And it's to do with, firstly, the villain, like you say. I feel like he isn't really magnetic enough. You don't really feel any tension from him at all. But there's also, I, I point fingers at uh, Asia Argento. Okay. You take Domino or Waylin or Electric King, something like that. They come in slightly later in the film and they give it an extra bit of energy. There's a love interest. There's a spark between the two characters, usually. Something to play off of and something for the viewer to pay attention to. And we get a lot from Vin Diesel early on. I feel like the battle should have been handed over to Asia Argento and Martin Sokers, I believe that's how you pronounce his name. Yep. Um for their characters to sort of take the lead a little bit and bring some energy to the film. But I don't think either of them particularly deliver. So then it just leaves it just hanging on what uh, Vin Diesel did at the start. Yeah. And like, I really love the casting of Asia Argento. Um, she's the daughter of Dario Argento, the horror master who made movies like Deep Red, Suspiria. Like he's a legend and she's a director in her own right and has obviously acted in a number of his, of his films as well as other films. The idea of casting her in this role, I think, was genius. Because when you look at the Bond franchise, they were often kind of looking for more either traditional Hollywood star types. Like, they want star power or, you know, in the case of, like, a Denise Richards, they're kind of going for what's hot at this very moment. I really like Asia Argento because it's someone who, the way they kind of make her up, you totally get that sort of alternative rock vibes. You think of, like, mm -hmm. you know, the band Garbage with um, Shirley Manson or Holly McNarland, artists of that period. So I think they were right on the right track. I think she was good casting. 
I just wonder if they needed a little more spark to that character as opposed to sort of this character who is shown to be very active towards the end of the movie where we find out her background working as, you know, in the Russian intelligence. But early on just seems kind of just there in kind of a more passive role. I like some of her banter with Diesel, but yeah, I kind of know what you mean in terms of like injecting energy. That's not really what her character does. And I don't think I really felt the the passion between the two of them. Not that I've ever felt passion from Vin Diesel. <laughs> no, I actually think Vin Diesel's really lousy in um, romantic scenes. It's not just tied to this movie. It's really across the board. The most spark I've ever seen with him and uh, an actress on screen was him and Helen Mirren in the last Fast and Furious movie, Fast 9. Like, he seems absolutely alive in a scene with Helen Mirren. But... Are you saying that Vin Diesel has a kink? He might. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> He's into them gilfs. He's a gilf man. <laughs> I do not profess to know anything about the uh, the life of Vin Diesel. <laughs> it's an absolute mystery. I mean, and, and you can take it from Cam, guys. He has studied Vin Diesel's tapes to try and find that perfect sex scene where he gets it right. But he just mm, doesn't. Yeah, exhaustive efforts. But there are like kiss scenes in this movie that are very uncomfortable. And I say that as someone who has watched Roger Moore kiss scenes. <laughs> You'd rather watch him kiss Stacey Sutton than, uh, than Vin Diesel kiss Asia Argento. Yeah, that's saying something, isn't They're it? both pretty uncomfortable to watch. Did you find that to be the case as well? Absolutely. I really struggled with the, the, the romantic scenes between them. Like The bit at the end with Bora Bora as well is quite cringy. Yeah. Despite it looking nice. But I suppose, um, I suppose I'll, I'll say what I think about the film now. I mean, you know, this isn't our first Vin Diesel film that we've covered, I should say. You know, we have covered what people say is his magnum opus, you know, the, the height of Vin Diesel's work, which is, of course, the seminal Fast 9. Hmm. Now, um, we didn't really talk about Vin Diesel's performance too much in that episode, because I think by this point he is just coasting his way through those films, if you'll pardon the driving pun. Yeah. Uh, but... I, this was meant to be, I mean, in terms of this film, I think he's really impactful. I think he's a bundle of energy. And I don't think I've really seen him like this since maybe, I've seen Pitch Black since. And I think he's really good in that too. I don't like the sequels to Pitch Black, but um, this is probably my favorite Vin Diesel film I've ever seen. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, I'll put Saving Private Ryan a little higher, but in terms of star vehicles. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. In, in terms of Vin Diesel star vehicles, I really liked Pitch Black. I might come down on the pitch black uh, train, but not by a, uh, you know, huge gulf. And also, I don't know, are we considering like Fast Five? Because I think like Fast Five is pretty top tier. It's a good film. I don't think it's a great Vin Diesel film where he is the sole focus of the film. Yeah. Well, I mean, so much of the energy from that movie comes from the rock and the ensemble. So, mm -hmm. yeah, in terms of just Vin Diesel star vehicles where he is the guy in the spotlight, um, this is probably the best. Uh, I, I mean, well, depends where you come down. I, I think I would probably edge Pitch Black a little closer, but um, yeah, it's pretty close. I mean, in terms of my thoughts on it, though, I, I wrote down all sizzle, some steak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great film. You can watch it. It's an easy watch. You don't struggle to wrap your head around it. It's not one of these Cold War thrillers where you're having to plot something out on a whiteboard to figure out the plot of the film. It's it's following those Bond tropes very beat by beat. It knows what it wants to be, and it knows how to, to play it. And that, that works fine. I just think that it falls down later in the film, the second half maybe. I think it's bad guy and it's love interest uh, are not as great. I think it's M in Samuel Jackson. I think he's always good in everything I see Samuel Jackson, and he brings something interesting to it, and he does in this too. I think overall this film lacks some of maybe the charm of a Bond film that it's trying to emulate. Like, if you're going to do a Bond film, there has to be something not just cool. Like, it, it does cool. The stunts are cool. The music is cool. Vin Diesel is cool. I'm That's fine. Even as in 2021, Vin Diesel is still cool. But it's not charming. It's not as witty as I think it probably could have been. And if they were going to go the extreme way, maybe it should have been a higher rating. Maybe there should have been a bit more blood and guts and, and titillation. I think it's okay, though, to play it to the teen market. Um, that I think you could double down on the X Games type of vibe, and that, for me, is enough. I think there may be a problem here, though, 
And I don't think I ever would have been able to put my finger on this at the time. It's something I really thought about after my viewing last night. And that this movie wants to be, you know, very youth directed. Like this is supposed to be the jolt in the arm to spy films that Bond can't deliver anymore because Bond is getting old. And I'm wondering if part of the disconnect for me is that, okay, you have Vin Diesel's your star. This is a up and coming, super exciting star. You have a writer, Rich Wilkes who is also quite young at this point in time and working in edgier projects. And then you have a team behind the camera that's actually older than the team that made Die Another Day. Uh, so like Rob Cohen was not a young guy at this point. The cinematographer who's, you know, really respectable, Dean Semler, had done movies like The Road Warrior, Dances with Wolves, Apocalypto, but he was almost 60 at the time this movie's made. And I couldn't help but wonder if my issues with the pace and kind of there's a little bit of a visual flatness to a lot of this movie. Um, some of the stunts really come alive, but in terms of just like an eye popping movie that I think grabs people, it just seems a little flat. And I'm wondering if, you know, I don't know that they would have been willing, especially for a new studio to bring in like a really hot young director at this point in time who thought outside the box. But I'm wondering if you'd plug this script, Vin Diesel, with like a director like, I don't know, like a Joseph Kahn or even at the at this point in time, like Neville Dean and Taylor, who did like the Crank movies, if they would have looked at this and said, OK, you want Bond for a young generation that we understand, we can do that versus a group of 50 year olds saying, yes, we understand what 20 year olds are thinking. Scott, I am 40 now. I don't understand what 20 year olds are thinking. What up, fellow kids? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, like, I do wonder if, you know, 21-year-old Cam would have come out of the theater raving if they'd had filmmakers who were really, like, working on the edge of what youth-oriented filmmaking could be. That's probably it. That is probably the problem. I, I just think about, you know, it has this really propulsive first half, or first act, maybe. There's some great stunt work. Yeah, I think it's Bridge and the, the, the farm, the, the uh, cocaine farm is great, which we'll get to in a bit. But then I just feel like it just does stunts more and more in the film. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else it, it really throws into it. There's no interesting camera work, particularly. The colors don't pop. I mean, I watched it on Blu-ray and it still didn't look very nice now. Um, it's quite sort of gray and sort of muted in its, in its sort of visual spectrum. And I don't think that really excites people. No, and like, I appreciate that the movie is doing the opposite of Bond. Like, Bond is a celebration of like, high class lifestyle right like it's going to all the big expensive places that none of us could ever afford to go and i like that this is a world that's i guess comparatively sort of like the uh the lower class right it's like underground raves and bars and parties and things like that and you get to see you know vin diesel wander through these kind of worlds that we would uh you know that seem really cool on screen but there's like a club, for example, where it's just like electro stuff going all over. I don't even know what it is, like electricity volts going everywhere. <laughs> and I'm like, what an amazing, awesome location. I wish this had been shot by someone who could really make this pop. Like, I would wonder what some of these party scenes would look like with like an edgier director. Someone who was maybe less traditional and someone with more of a visual stamp. Because I think there would be a way to really just tap into the energy that the filmmakers you know want to achieve here well speaking of visual stamp i want to talk about the stunts in terms of things i liked mm -hmm. um i could pick them all out i think the bridge jump at the start looks quite good but for me the most impressive one is at the cocaine farm when they blow up that barn and the, the and then vin diesel or the stunt double rides the motorcycle over the top with the helicopter shooting in from behind that just looked awesome that was clearly a practical stunt and it looked great yeah, and I mean, the stunts, as you said, they look fantastic, but they also feel like legit something you would not get in a Bond film. Bond would go big. You'd have skydiving or, you know, the bungee jump in Goldeneye, like major, major stunts. But I like how this movie just amps them up that extra degree to make them seem just that much more explosive. As you said, um, you know, jumping off the like building there that's exploding on the bike. Um there's a lot of cool things. I love a moment later in the movie where he's jumping the bike and like shoots a guy while flying through the air. Moments like that just feel really exciting in a way that 
stunt work wasn't really doing at this point in time. It feels like they're taking all the resources of the sort of X game athlete sort of training and really applying it. And I think really pulling it off. I would actually, I'm going to be really interested to revisit the sequels because I have um, next to no memories of the second one and decent memories of the third. So I'm just curious to see the evolution of the stunt work because I really think that is something that really drew people into this franchise and really does still hold up. I loved, loved, loved this film when it came out. I I decided at the time I didn't want to see the second one because it didn't have Vin Diesel. Yeah. And then I never watched the third one because by this point, I don't really feel like he's as Xandery as he should be. But I haven't watched it, so I maybe I'm uh, judging it too early. The second one, you just automatically have a bit of an issue in that, like, Vin Diesel is a far more physical performer than Ice Cube is. Like, Ice Cube is actually a very strong actor in his own right, but it's not necessarily his thing to be doing wild stunt sequences, whereas Vin Diesel, that's so much a part of his persona. Mm. I think that helps with all of these set pieces that we're talking about, the stunt stuff, is that Vin Diesel is a young actor trying to prove himself in Hollywood and get that big starring role that just launches him. He's had a couple of films already. But as you said earlier, this was really his his big hit you look at say like the roger moore bond films where like you're seeing a lot of obvious stunt doubles there's a legitimacy to the stunts in triple x that you immediately go yeah i buy this like i buy that the character i see on screen played by vin diesel is doing these things versus you know like roger moore bond and view to a kill where (laughs) it's like comedic how obvious the stunt double work is and that you really can't in your mind align the two characters I mean, at this point, Vin Diesel was 35. Yeah. When this film came out. So 34 when he shot it. It's not that far for an 18-year-old to say, that guy's close to me. Mm -hmm. And they can put themselves in their shoes. No 18-year-old going to the cinema is putting themselves in the shoes of Roger Moore in A View to a Kill. (laughs) Well, I did. I was like, ah, this reminds me of my youth watching Roger Moore in this movie. (laughs) I miss the, the heady days of hanging off of ladders from fire engines. and <laughs> Making a lot of sounds going, ooh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Serving quiche to people, you know, the, the, the best times. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that is something, you raise a really good point. When I saw Triple X, you know, in 2002, I did not look at Vin Diesel as being significantly older than us. Like, he was a little bit older. It's kind of that... Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, that whole generation, they're a little bit older than than I am, but you still look at them as kind of being contemporary just in terms of being young. Yeah, and then you also can see he's doing his own stunts. You appreciate the craft and the effort that he's put into it, so you kind of just get on board with the film. Mm -hmm. I think we both praised Vin Diesel and his performance. I don't don't really have any issue with what he did in this film, which is surprising revisiting it because I'm not really a Vin Diesel guy. But uh, and I see his films now and I tend to be like, oh, he's just sort of phoning it in and just grumbling his way through it. But I genuinely enjoyed watching him in this film. I did too. And I think his best scene, maybe the moment in the diner where he's going through the test and he's like playing up sort of the eye rolling comedic nature of the scene, but also just how sharp his character is at picking out exactly why this test being staged by the NSA is just a test and not a real world scenario I like that there's sort of the street smart aspect to this character and the way he kind of cuts through, you know, ingrained training of agents in a way that, you know, you understand why they're looking to someone who can think outside the box because he does. And I think he exhibits it well and he's very lively in his sort of navigating this world. And it's something I, I think I wish that I'd gotten more of that throughout. There's actually a very small moment that I noted that I really appreciated which is when he's going to the um, big mansion to go stay there with Yorkie and his buddies, mm-hmm. that he stops outside and he's like doing um, you know sweeps around the area, just eyeing the security cameras and the setup of the area. I like the idea of tying sort of spy craft in with this guy's approach to life. I just maybe wish we'd gotten a few more instances of it because it would really, I think, make the movie pop. Whereas a lot of the stuff, when it kind of falls plot-based, And just the way the filmmaking is going on, the way it's shot and the way it looks, it feels like we're kind of going through a recycled Bond plot as opposed to watching an actor who's a real fly in the ointment kind of upsetting a normal Bond plot. 
Well, firstly, I need to correct you. You should be addressing him as the nihilist Yogi. Sure. Yeah, of course. At all times. Um, but I, I, I completely get why someone would be behind this sort of anti-hero, anti-establishment, uh, you know, F you to the government type guy. You know, he is so done with their nonsense in that diner scene. But he shows he has the aptitude. Like if he had been born three decades earlier, he would have been James Bond because he had the aptitude to be a great spy. But the life he's living now means he doesn't trust the government. And he's, he's because you, know, you look at the beginning that people are trying to hire him to sell out. And he's like, I don't sell out. <laughs> And all this sort of stuff, like whatever, that's very early noughties, that's fine. But it instantly gets you on board because not only has he got the aptitude to do it, he also just doesn't care. He's kind of aloof to the whole thing. Yeah, he's, he has that sort of classic Vin Diesel, I'm above it all. But I think just because there's so much more energy to Vin Diesel's performance, it feels more grounded in a way that his other more recent stuff does. Like, you watch his performance of Dom Toretto in that last Fast and Furious movie, it's like, I don't even, this is in no way a recognizable human being. <laughs> I mean, he has a superhuman strength in the Fast and Furious films. But then again, I don't think Vin Diesel has ever really been bound by the laws of physics. That is also true. And I don't want to see him bound by the laws of physics. So, yeah, I'm happy if he's flying through the air doing random things. Yeah, all for it. Uh, another thing I liked was, and we kind of mentioned it earlier, but the soundtrack for this film. Yeah. I think tying into both of our love for, for heavy metal, um, you've got stuff from Ramstein, and they open the film up. It's actually, they're actually in the film performing. You've got Drowning Pool, Hate Breed, Queens of the Stone Age, Mushroom Head, and then, of course, the best uh, metal artist ever, Moby. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, 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 I had this soundtrack on CD. I think it was a big part of me enjoying this film, and I still enjoy listening to it now. Yeah, like there's definitely a few musical cues that I kind of just smiled when I hear them because I go, oh, yeah. Um, I don't know that the movie incorporates them quite as strongly as I'd like. Like they don't feel like the big fist pumping needle drops that you kind of wish they were. They feel a little more like wallpaper sometimes. But um, I mean, it's impossible for me to not just fawn over the opening of this movie with the Ramstein appearance. Like... As someone who's been to a few Ramstein concerts, uh, I love seeing them. I really enjoy their albums. This was during the period where they put out arguably their best album, uh, Mutter. And this song is spectacular live. I've seen it multiple times. And what a great mission statement for your movie, where you kick in where this this classic agent in a tuxedo, very, you know, I guess bondish is going to a Rammstein concert and is very quickly killed and carried away on, you know, by a mosh pit crowd surfing. It's like very much kicking open the doors of like, the old ways are dead. We're now at a Rammstein concert, baby, and it's going to be a party. Well, that's that's how I saw it too on this most recent watch. Is It's got this whole like, these these old guys don't get us. Because the, the Bond agent, the, the, the secret agent that gets killed in the tuxedo, he looks around, he's like, oh God, like a, like a rock concert. What am I doing here? And he looks confused the whole time. And eventually he's shot by um, the nihilist Yorgi's assassin. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's just, as you say, a great mission statement, putting the flag down. This is not about old men in rooms talking to each other. This is, this is extreme, baby. <laughs> and I actually like it as an introduction to Yorgi and Yelena, where you just kind of get a good shot of them watching all of this happen so it does establish them right from the get-go all non-verbally like i always say you know if you can run a sequence like that without dialogue and they stick in your mind for continuing on through the movie it really succeeds so i think honestly this set piece um is really really effective it's the sort of thing that the movie i think maybe needed a couple more moments of this of just complete visual inspiration where they just kind of let cinema do the speaking instead of some of the more expositionary stuff or just kind of the hanging around waiting for things to happen because it's there in the stunt sequences it's there in the opening i'd argue it's there in the finale as well but like these injections of energy i think are really what especially a youth audience of 2002 really wanted nobody wants to be in the expositionary position <laughs> that is not triple x <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's not extreme, baby. <laughs> That's not the Xander zone. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> oh no, my head went to that. Oh no, I don't want to. Don't want to picture that again. Thanks. Um, have you got any other things that you particularly liked that you want to call out, Cam? There was one other bit that I actually really enjoyed too at the end. Um, the whole um, you know, watercraft that Vin Diesel has to get on top of and drive into the water. Like, there's genuine tension in this action sequence that. You and I have watched many an action film where there's no tension whatsoever. We've, you know, slagged a number of them on this podcast for being just so flat. This one, when you have that moment of him pulling the handle to drive it into the water, pretty effective moment. Pretty awesome. Bora Bora. <laughs> um, I, I actually really like that scene for its cheesiness because mm-hmm. it just has that really like insane Roger Moore Bond feel to it. Yeah, you know, it, it, massive gadgets and whatnot, and, and insane vehicles. It, it's not very early Connery or Craig, for instance. Or I could see Pierce Brosnan mounting that thing too. <laughs> Triple X. <laughs> <laughs> now that's extreme, baby. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, we've avoided some really easy jokes so far, so I'm sorry they're going to start popping out. I think. Yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I did like that scene at the end. I, I, I think it was a nice sort of climax. <laughs> Triple X, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's falling apart. Um, yeah, I think that was well done. I, I, I think for a, a conclusion of a film, I think it, it added a bit of tension that was missing at that point. Well, you and I have talked about movies where we will cite like a huge action sequence that happens at the opening or in the midpoint. It's being a real highlight and then kind of going, oh, that finale, it was OK. Mm. I think this movie actually delivers in its final action sequence, which it doesn't, you know, basically throw everything up at the front of it. It actually had a strong way to go out. So I do appreciate that. I also appreciate that the nihilist Yorgi went out the same way that um, the nemesis in Condor Man and also the bad guys in From Russia With Love all went out by driving their boats into a rock face. That's true. That's true. Although, let's talk about Yorgi because it's something that really stuck in my craw even back in 2002, last night as well. It's like this character just does not click with me. And I I don't even know if I can put my finger on why. I, I don't know. I mean, I was doing some research before we went on, on here and apparently Ewan McGregor was in talks to do this role at one point. Okay. And you, you've got to believe this would have been a different character. If, if McGregor was doing it. Yeah, if you had him channeling some of that Black Mask energy from Birds of Prey, like, that would have been something else. That was quite Triple X, too, to be fair. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, I, I I don't know. I really don't know what it is. I, it, I, Some people might say, hey, it's, he's, he's not talking with an English accent. Maybe it's kind of hard to hear what he's saying sometimes. I don't think that's the problem. No. Much as we're talking to the guy who wrote the script later this week, and we do speak to him about the villain quite a lot and some of our disappointment with the villain. And I think this is where the script fails in creating a villain that can come up against Triple X. Oh, God, I said come up against. <laughs> oh, geez. Um, yeah, like, I think the problem is when you look at say some of the Bond villains that all really pop, they have very clear distinguishing characteristics. And like, if they want to go a different direction, that's fine. But it's like, they decide to go with someone who's like, honestly, like this character feels like he would be more of a um, henchman in a Bond film, which is totally cool. But I don't think there's anything about him that pops when he's on screen. And like Martin Sokas was an actor who I've seen play a lot of villains and a lot of the movies he was in weren't particularly memorable, but he was good in Kingdom of Heaven, especially the um, director's cut that Ridley Scott put out. He's very effective there. There's something about this where, like, what is his thing? Like, there's no kind of, like, quirk to him. He kind of plays the kind of a sleazy party animal kind of guy, but he doesn't seem overly threatening because we see that um, Xander is clearly a lot smarter than him. He doesn't come across as, like, a brain. He's an anarchist, which is fun. I wish they'd maybe channeled a little more punk rock energy into that character or something. Like, make him feel, if he's not going to feel like a Bond villain who, you know, is really memorable, make him seem like something completely different. Something you would never, ever, ever get in a Bond movie. Whereas here, I don't know. Like, I could totally see this character existing in 
sort of a Bond film where he wasn't particularly memorable there either. I was just, while you were talking there, trying to think of what you could do to alter it, really. Like, th- does he need a gimmick? I think a gimmick or just, like, can you sum up this guy's personality in, with a lot of traits? Uh, he's angry. Yeah. He's a bit gruff. Yeah. So is Triple X. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, he, he's also an idiot. This is something I noted down. He makes several bad decisions, which means I think that I do think that sometimes puts audiences off. Mm-hmm. Like if you have a smart villain, say let's take Silver from Skyfall. I, I mean, I mean, chasing Bond all the way to Scotland wasn't a very smart choice, but you know he had a big plan and he's a pretty cool villain. In this film, <laughs> the annihilist Yorgi for some reason, invites Vin Diesel into Anarchy 99, despite Vin Diesel making no overture to join yeah. his secret organization. So I don't know why he invites him in the first place. But this is something... Uh, I was reading Roger Ebert's review, and I will give him credit for this line. But who on earth would design a boat to destroy parts of the world in a country that's landlocked? <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I mean, look, I'm not going to take too many shots at that because it's the sort of preposterous spy villain, um, you know, kind of thing that the Bond movies are just as guilty of. Uh, you know, you look at Max Zorin's plan in View to a Kill makes no sense whatsoever. But, um, yeah, like, that is true. I wonder, with Yorgi, if it would have been better to establish his threat level because so much of the movie is Vin Diesel conning him that you want to have that moment where you're like, this guy is seriously scary. Like you understand the tension of what Xander's up against. It seems like anytime he's found out, he's able to just talk his way back into this guy's circle or, you know, just completely crashes the party completely. You never get a sense of just how incredibly dangerous Yorgi is. So we're back to him being an idiot again, I guess. Yeah. Like, is he too much of a lightweight um, for like if you're trying to introduce your new spy character to the world, which they're trying to do here with Xander Cage, you want a villain that he really has to rise up against mm. who seems like, to, you know, really test his metal out of the gate. So the audience gets on board. You know, you look at like when they reintroduce, um, you know, Daniel Craig as bond in, um, you know, Casino Royale. Um, Le Chiffre is not a top tier bond villain in terms of what his big scheme is. He's not trying to destroy the world or anything, but like, he comes across as very threatening and very dangerous throughout. Whereas I don't think Yorgi has that threat level. He never really has the upper hand at any point. I, I will throw an idea at you, though, about how we could improve it. Okay. Have him kill Asia Argento. You can't kill the female lead of the movie. I Okay, if we're going to do the whole Bechdel test thing, then sure, you could throw that at me. Or you could just write another good female character into the film. But I mean, have it, or maybe have him kill Samuel Jackson, or have him kill the the Q character that's kind of bumbling around the film. Uh, like he, there are never, he never really seems to do anything that's effective. So you don't fear him. Like, okay, he knows that uh, Asia Argento is a spy, but for some reason lets her infiltrate his organization for five years. Yeah, and leak leak all of his plans. So. He's like a bumbling idiot. And I, I just, I, I think people won't get behind it. Yeah. Yeah, I think like, you know, a lot of these movies live or die depending on the strength of the villain. And just the villain here has always dragged it down for me a bit to the point where even like his big, you know, comeuppance and death felt a little underwhelming. I remember in theaters being like, oh, that's it? Oh, okay. And, you know, Rich does talk with us about that, that that wasn't the original plan. Like they had, I think, different ideas in terms of how to pay off that villain. But it just... It feels like he doesn't necessarily, I don't know, he doesn't really grab you that much through the course of the movie, and then even sort of the comeuppance is kind of a bit of a shoulder shrug. Look, guys, neither of us are screenwriters. We're not here to try and pitch an improved version. But ultimately, I feel like this is one of the Achilles heels of the film, and it's the villain. It really does take its leg out. My favorite moment of him is actually when they are gassing the scientists, which feels like the sort of thing, you know, from like, say, Moonraker or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he's like, they are little mice or whatever he says, or rats or whatever it is. Like that kind of line, it was so weird and delivered in such a fun way that I'm like, 
oh, give this character a few more moments like that, and I wonder if he would pop more for me. Well, maybe that's another thing too. Like, does he have any memorable lines? You've quoted one there, but you weren't even sure of what he said. Yeah, like there's not a lot, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe, I, I think a gimmick works. If you're going to do a Bond film, the villain having a gimmick is not a stretch. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, I'm not saying he has to have a peg leg or a laser arm or something like that. We're not having to go to the extreme, but, you know, just something that makes him stand out because he is very early 2000s white guy villain. And maybe a henchman or something that's really memorable because he's got a two a couple really tall dudes, but they don't have a lot of personality. There's the guy that smokes. Um, I appreciate that the uh, Vin Diesel character, who's this anti-establishment badass character, is like, hey, don't smoke. So that feels very early 2000s. But <laughs> it's kind of like when the henchman, you know, the, the primary henchman's main thing is that he smokes. Not a lot there? Not not a lot to get excited about, I guess. No, not particularly. Um, the other, I suppose, I suppose, quibble I have with the film is just the dip it takes in the second half, like you mentioned earlier. But I, I think this all ties into the villain again. So I, I don't want to dig any further into that because I, I think it's just something that we can't fix. I think it's probably a combo. The villain, maybe where the uh, Asia Argento character is at that point, where there's not a lot of movement going on there. Um, mm. I think it's a few factors. I, I still do think, though, like Rob Cohen, just as a director, I've liked some of his stuff, but he's not that injection of real energy, I think, maybe that would have, I don't know, made this movie really come to life in a bigger way. But it's weird because he clearly captures the stunts enough for them to stand out to us, but everything else just seems bland. But how much of the stunt stuff, I really, I mean, I wasn't on the production, but how much of that is second unit? and just a stunt team. It's a fair point. It's a fair point. I just, it's one of my quibbles is I just think it, it, you said flat. That's a good word for it. I just put not particularly interesting. I, I there's not many visuals apart from the stunts in this film. There's no like, uh, okay. Like bond at the plane backer at the table is not a stunt. No, but it's an instantly recognizable scene and it stands out. It's a memorable vi image on the screen. There isn't many of those apart from the explosions. Yeah, and I mean, they give Vin Diesel a lot of lines, a lot of very memorable lines to make him really pop out, just to give those sort of bursts of energy. And I think they're effective. Mm. Um, but yeah, it just feels like the movie's like punctuated by really fantastic stunt sequences, good Vin Diesel moments. You just want the overall kind of plot to be a little bit stronger. Yeah, I, I'm going to put that more at the director and cinematographer's desk. I think the script is... Is is pretty good. I think what Rich did was was a good job overall. I mean, it's a yeah, totally like functional spy plot that I think, in terms of what you want to get across to an audience, really works. Like no one is going to be confused sitting through this movie, which is I think important, um, especially when you're trying to ground your character and set up a franchise. It's just to me, it I think it comes from the energy of the filmmaking going on here. Uh, what about you? Do you have any any quibbles you want to point out? Um. I don't think there really are too many. Like so much of it is just tied to that kind of slack energy there in the middle and um, and the villain stuff. Um, the Asia Argenta character, I think I liked more just because she felt so unconventional in comparison to, you know, the Bond girls we get. Like I mm -hmm. like the energy of her and I like Asia Argento. And, um, you know, I, I do wonder, you know, you said like – there's maybe not a lot of energy. I don't think this production was particularly good for her. We should note um, that she later came out and um, said that she was drugged and sexually assaulted by the director, Rob Cohen. And Rob Cohen has had a couple other allegations as well. And so, like, this is a case where I just wonder sometimes if real world circumstances rightfully could have impacted the performance. Like, maybe a different director different circumstances she would be maybe a little more lively in this movie i don't know i can't even say that's up for her to say but obviously there's very grim circumstances going on tied to a performance we're now having to critique i mean cam you could have shared this with me earlier before i spent 20 minutes like raging on her character <laughs> well yeah yeah um i f fair play and that, that is an entirely fair point i think most of my problems are more the villain than her character i think there are bits of her where she's great i think the chemistry isn't there with vin diesel but that that's not necessarily on her yeah 
that is a common <laughs> problem in the world of cinema. Uh, not a lot of people have chemistry with Vin Diesel on screen. Like, Vin Diesel is kind of a bit of a showboater as an actor, and I don't know that that necessarily lends itself to romantic chemistry where you kind of have to be an equal, you know, you have to be on equal footing. Well, I, I did have a question for you. And as this film is is taking bits of Bond films, and we've mentioned a couple so far, Spy Who Loved Me, uh, Moonraker, which Bond film do you think this is closest to? Oh, boy. Um, hmm. Like, I would say there's elements of Goldfinger where a lot of it is him hanging out with the villain. Because in that mm. movie, he's golfing with him. He's sitting at his, you know, estate in Kentucky. And then you have the big reveal of what his plot actually is. And the way that Bond is, you know, peeking through that model, seeing what Operation Grand Slam is, is not that dissimilar to Vin Diesel with the, um, you know, goggles, the x-ray goggles, watching the gassing and finding out exactly what the big Yorgi plot is. So I would say just on a template level, probably Goldfinger. Yeah, I think that was probably I mean, closest to what I had in my notes as well. It, it does take a lot of the outrageous moments maybe not moments, but a rageous sort of feel of the Roger Moore films. Yeah, the stunts all feel very much evoking that sort of, you know, the Moonraker skydive at the start, Spy Who Loved Me, the you know, the big jump off the cliff there. Like, moments like that feel very Roger Moore. But yeah, just in structure, even the um, Yelena character is a little bit similar to Pussy Galore, who's just hanging around Goldfinger throughout that movie. So, yeah. And, and turns Vin Diesel away, much like Pussy Galore turns Bond away. Yeah, exactly. And this one is less uncomfortable than Goldfinger. So, hey, that is one tick mark in the um, pro column for Triple X over Goldfinger. There's not many of those, but it's nice that it has the one. Yeah. Um, another question I had was, this is more of like a, a time thing, because obviously, you know, as you said, you were in your late 60s when this film came out. Mm, yeah. What is the obsession? And obviously the director and Vin Diesel had made Fast and Furious two years prior or a year. What is the obsession with cars? I don't have it, but it was a big deal at the time. I would have to sit there and go through, um, you know, TV records and stuff. Like, when did Top Gear start? Is this around that era? I have no idea. Or was that more of a response to the popularity of automobiles in pop culture? I really don't know. But, you know, Fast and Furious, obviously, is the year before. So Rob Cohen shoots that. And it makes a lot of sense for him to continue that sort of obsession into this movie. Uh, Top Gear, as you know, it started. I'm just looking this up now. It's not off the top of my head, guys. I'm not really a car guy. Uh, started in 2002. Oh, interesting. Uh, but it is actually a remake of an original show um, that also starred Jeremy Clarkson in. Uh, it started in 1977. So it was a British staple that's at one point along the line. It was just brought back. I think part of it is also that just America is very focused on cars, right? Like it's a big car country. And so if you're going to make your American James Bond, you're going to want to showcase American cars. And to be fair, James Bond has its fair share of cars too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I, I just, it, it, it made a point to be like, you know, they had the, was it a GTO? Um, like yeah, it's a GTO, yeah. Yeah, which uh, it means nothing to, to Cam or I, but uh, I, I suppose for like motorheads or whatever you call yourselves that are fans of cars, I, I hope you enjoyed that bit of the film. But for me, it, like him going there and buying a bunch of cars, I didn't really understand why <laughs> that was a way of doing it. I didn't really get that point. You know what? It gave them a showcase for cars. So I'm sure people, there's a certain segment of the audience that was very happy. So I think also like, um, and I believe we, when we talked to Rich, he said like Fast and Furious, you know, it was not particularly, um, influential on this movie just because of the fact that he was writing that before Fast and Furious even came out. Mm. But it almost feels like if you were to ignore the context of what he said, if you were just examining those films, you know, in terms of the works of Vin Diesel, you would say there's influence from Fast and Furious going into this movie, just the way it's showcasing cars. You have the same producer as the Fast and Furious franchise, same director. So it's like, it's there, but I just wonder if it was more of a cultural thing as opposed to a movie to movie thing. I, I feel like it must have been in the sort of popular conscience at the time. I, I, I mean, I was 15, as you say, when this film came out. I, I, I wasn't driving and I've never been a fan of cars, so I wasn't really following this sort of stuff. 
but you know, I, I suppose if I went out a little dive into pop culture and you know, oh one, oh two, maybe there are a, a litany of car films. Yeah, like I think there was like I remember like shows in the nineties that were like um, there was like a Knight Rider um, kind of ripoff called Viper about like a really you know awesome sports car that could do cool things. You also had, I think, a Knight Rider reboot probably around this time. So, yeah, I think it's just like every now and again, you know, just the car craze emerges again in Hollywood. You would have had it in the 70s. You know, you mentioned Top Gear being in the 70s. Well, that's the era of stuff like Smokey and the Bandit and all these car chase movies, you know, the Cannonball Run. So I guess this was just, you know, car culture's time to reemerge. Yeah, but speaking of the the popular conscience and the, the sort of zeitgeist out there, the other thing this film talks a bit about at the start and then forgets about for the rest of the film is the fact that Xander Cage is an activist. Yeah. For popular culture, or, or at least someone in the boardroom's interpretation of what popular culture is in 2002. Um, now, I know at the time there was a lot of like senators and stuff and other politicians in other countries pressing for restrictions on video games and you know, metal music and things like that because it was bad for the kids. And it starts off with Vin Diesel stealing someone's car because he's trying to ban video games. Oh, sorry, trying to ban skateboarding, I think. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, he's no trying to ban uh, trying to ban rap music and video games. Right, and that feels like it's a very much a, a, a cultural touch point at that at that time. It's, it's not really spoken about now. People aren't really trying to ban video games anymore. But I remember that being a big topic of conversation in the early noughties and late nineties. Yeah, it's because um, the Columbine shootings in 99, and it sort of came out of that. That's when a lot of um, more, I guess, aggressive music was targeted, as well as first-person shooter video games and things like that. So um, the fact that the movie is basically saying up front, hey, like this is not what's causing the problems. The problems are elsewhere. Those are uh, you know, something that youth culture understands that adults don't. I mean, just right off the bat, you have him stealing that old senator's car and jumping off a you know bridge there and destroying it. Like, mm-hmm. it's very much taking aim at this older generation that doesn't understand young people. Yeah, I suppose. I, I mean, obviously, that was a smart move mm-hmm. because it worked. It got people into the theaters and it, it made people fans of the Triple X character because it has two more films that we will, of course, be reviewing. My question to you is: If this didn't exist, if they didn't make Triple X in two thousand and two, and you know, Rich decided to write the script now. What would be the cultural touchstones of now that the Triple X character would be, you know, supporting if he was being an activist? TikTok? I mean, we're, we're probably <laughs> making it harder for ourselves because we're not young anymore. Yeah, you're asking me. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think. Um, it really is showing my age. I, I used to think I was quite in touch with this sort of stuff, but oh, long gone now. I suppose it is probably social media. Fortnite? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. For, Fortnite and social media, I guess is what it is. So so Xander Cage would be a, a, a TikTok and influencer. Yeah, oh, yeah, bang on. You nailed it. Yeah, he'd be making those 20-second videos of him driving cars off. I, would it involve cars? Um, no, because kids, kids these days are more environmentally uh, responsible and aware of their impact. So I don't think he would be driving muscle cars. Well, unless they're taking gas-guzzling cars and driving them off cliffs in favor of electric vehicles. Oh, so that's his big plot. Is yeah. to, uh, he, he goes to the country club and swaps the guy's engine out for a catalytic converter. I don't want to watch this movie, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm just trying to think if it's true. Because obviously the whole X thing is tied into this time too. It's X Extreme. I'm trying to think of what his name would be now if he's not going to be Triple X. Oh, God, um, I, would it be like Elon Musk's kid with like a bunch of random squiggles as a name? I think that might be the villain. <laughs> yeah, that's probably it. Um, he, he maybe he's like Prince and he's just like a, a symbol. It's like Ambersand. Sure. Yeah, I think that would probably work. I don't know how people are going to pronounce that title or also search for it online, but good luck. <laughs> <laughs> they might get better results than you do if you search for this film. That's also true. Yeah. Do you have any final tidbits you want to talk about, Cam? Let's see, tidbits. I noted um, we have a cameo from the rapper Eve, and this is noteworthy because she also appeared in Charlie's Angels Full Throttle. So this is our second Eve appearance <laughs> on Spy Hearts. So the Eve's Hard podcast is is well underway. Yeah, yeah. So um, 
that's a moment in time as well. And the other thing that... It's really, really showing the era, isn't it? Because I've not heard Eve in a very long time. No, I, I, I really haven't. She's probably still around, right? I, I guess. I don't think she's dead, Cam, if that's what you're saying. No, I don't think that, but she's probably doing something, right? Like, there's... Pro- I don't know. I don't know anything about young music anymore. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Couple other tidbits. I really appreciated the um the leap between the barbed wire on the fence, which was very great escape. It's sort of like saying, "Oh, you thought the great escape was awesome," which feels like something an old filmmaker would make versus a young filmmaker. <laughs> but nonetheless, mm-hmm. I appreciated that they made it even more explosive. But I I do have visions of like uh you know the director and the cinematographer being like, "Remember that movie from our youth, The Great Escape." Let's top it. <laughs> Let's make it extreme. <laughs> yeah. But it looks awesome. So I'm down for it. And um, also just what did you think of the frequent shots of the triple X tattoos on the back of his neck as a signifier for who this character is and ways to in- introduce him? I thought as a shorthand, it's actually really effective. <laughs> I think it's great. I, I And people always like take the mickey out of James Bond for, you know, always saying his name and everyone knowing who he is. Sod it, he might as well get his name tattooed on the back of his head. It seems that it's still an effective spy, apparently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the movie embraces the absurd a lot of the time. And I think this just ties into it. Like, it makes it, you know, feel kind of fun. So uh, I enjoyed that. Oh, one thing we haven't touched on at all. What did you think of the snowboarding sequence? Uh, it was okay. I mean, it, it didn't really jump out to me particularly, I have to say. Yeah, it was like a real showpiece. Like, they used to really heavily market that one in the trailers. I remember, mm. I don't know if this was internationally, but I remember they hear a lot of the TV spots and stuff were set to the band Our Lady Peace, which is a Canadian group that I never considered that cool. They were kind of like your dad's rock kind of band. I, I always thought that was a weird choice. But, um, yeah, like, the, the snowboarding is cool. Like, I think there's some, you know, neat little tricks in there, but the kind of CG avalanche doesn't work as well as it should. It was the era. CG avalanches, CG tsunamis. It's just uh, it's just what they did. They did, and this is really the only glaring usage of CG where I kind of, you know, the seams show. Like, I think they were very smart to go practical, um, as opposed to Die Another Day, which looked old the day it was released. So this one holds up better in that regard. It is, I think, very notable, though, that you have kind of a battle for the heir to the Bond throne this year. And this is the same year as the Bourne Identity, which would also go really practical, stripped down, young star. And it is interesting that that movie and the continuing sequels would really, you know, take off and um, establish what spy movies could be for a whole new generation. Whereas it seems like Triple X was so much more targeted on that. Like they were saying really loudly, we are the bond of the next generation. So it's interesting how the more unassuming franchise launch was the one that ultimately, you know, took off and ran with it. Well, it's also fair to say that that whole subculture sort of died off a few years later. Yeah, yeah. Like you can look at, a, you know, say Dr. No from 1962 and it's set of its time, but it feels kind of timeless. Mm. Whereas... Triple X feels very of its time. I mean, it's I, I can't remember where I heard this discussion. It might have been on a podcast, might have been a, a book I read. But basically, when you use music in uh, television, film, it's good to go with older stuff because it feels more timeless. Um, be that like you know pieces of orchestra work or just sort of older music, because if you go with contemporary stuff, it just sets the time it's in. Yeah. So having, you know, having um, Mushroom Head, having Ramstein, having Drowning Pool were great for me and you in 2002, but I wasn't listening to Drowning Pool in 2010. No, I don't listen. I mean, Ramstein, I still listen to, and actually Mushroom Head put out a good album recently, their newest one. So I have followed those two, but the majority of it didn't really jump out as much to me. Clearly neither of us have followed Eve. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Eve. <laughs> Although, you know, it's funny, you tying it back to Eve there, it's interesting to me how both Charlie's Angels and this movie very much feel like artifacts of the early 2000s in a way that, like, I wouldn't say that about Born Identity, which comes out the same year. Well, I, I Okay, this is one of those moments where I'm going to lean on you because you have been reviewing films for years and years and years. I think that's a very good point, and I cannot give you a solid answer as to why. Why do you think that is? 
I think it's it's so much embracing now that specific moment in pop culture. You can't even say two thousands. This is like two thousand two, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's everything, or probably two thousand one, which is when they'd be you know shooting it and developing it. It's so of the moment. Even a lot of the music here would die off in popularity like the following year or two where mm-hmm. more in terms of heavy metal it turns towards more of the hardcore stuff like um shadows fall and lamb of god like that sort of takes over the metal scene and the new metal this is kind of the last gasp of new metal really it's it's the last couple of years i mean lincoln park's two albums the two good albums have been out already and lincoln park was kind of the kind of charted the course of new metal yeah. When they died off, new metal just kind of went with them. People always say stuff like, like Limp Biscuit and you know, Static X, like you mentioned earlier, but Linkin Park was really the the herald of new metal for me. And and when they went away, that's when it died. And that's not long after this. And this is the pivot point where a lot of bands who are continuing on to now moved away from new metal. Like they may mm-hmm. have launched that way, but they changed their style. Whether it's you know Linkin Park did, Papa Roach, Slipknot. A lot of these bands, which maybe had very new metal influenced origins, became more something else, whether it was more pop based or more, you know, hardcore metal. Like they just moved away from what this particular sound was at this moment. And you think that's why age is there then? I think so, yeah. Also, X Games culture is just not as much a thing anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think that'll that'll went away. There was a real like a real moment in pop culture where all of the, this stuff that I was I was buying into, I was drinking that Kool Aid, that that new metal, the X Games, watching Jackass on MTV, uh, all this stuff was exactly what I was doing, and that really disappeared by the time I hit like eighteen, which was three years after this. Well, like if you're gonna base a movie on youth culture, youth culture burns fast, right? Because mm-hmm. you have an entire generation coming up. Another, you know, group of kids basically coming up like five years later, you know, something like that. So it it tends to be very quick and of the moment. Well, it's interesting you say that because one of the reviews I read, uh, the Rolling Stone review, which I I will mention in the week as well, it's actually quite an interesting review. But one line I I wrote down, which is James Bond for short attention spans. Yeah, I I get that. I do, but at the same time, the plot is actually a lot more kind of... Uh, measured in terms of its pace like it's a over two hour movie I would have thought that would apply more to something that they'd made like a 90 minute rapid fire kind of action movie versus something like this well the last comparison I want to make in terms of tidbits is to True Lies yeah it's got a lot of that vibe maybe not the music side of things but just in terms of the bombastic action but I think one thing that True Lies does over this film is it just has more charm yeah, I, I think this film is missing a key element of charm, which I don't think they wanted to have in the film because I think that isn't really what the pop youth culture were wanting at that point. They wanted to be more edgy, thus extreme. But I, I think it does, as you say, date it. And, and, and it really just means it's quite the relic of its time. And also, Rob Cohen, you are no James Cameron ever. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very much worth pointing out. But uh, anything else for us, Cam? No, I think that wraps me up on, uh, yeah. Right. Well, I think let's dive into the knock list. I'm actually really curious to see where this goes because I really like this film, but you always get the first vote, and I think you will maybe set the tone of where I end up on this one. So, Cam, I'll ask you the question. Is Triple X making the knock list? No, it doesn't make the knock list for me because we're talking about the all-timers here and we've enjoyed movies like Charlie's Angels or Men in Black that didn't make the list. I think this one has elements that are a lot of fun to revisit, whether it's Diesel's performance or the stunt work um, and just, you know, some of the some of the minor ways it kind of jabs at the Bond formula. But we've talked about it. The villain just doesn't really work. The pace goes kind of wonky in the second half. So for me, it's... a uh, it was an interesting rewatch. It was a movie that I was a little nervous about going back to, but I found myself more entertained than I feared I might be. So overall, I would say, people, check it out if you're looking for spy entertainment, fun movie. But um, no, it's not a knock list movie for me. I, I think I come down around about the same. I, I think maybe I enjoy it slightly more than you. If I was going to give it an out of 10 rating, it's probably one more than you. But I don't think if 
you know, which is the ultimate question of the knock list. Is this one of the greatest spy movies of all time? No, it's it's taking elements from some of the greatest spy movies of all time uh, and translating some of that well to popular culture in 2002. But because of that, it feels somewhat dated. Um, and it doesn't really hold up. If I was going to show a 16 year old now, I would rather tell them to go and watch True Lies or go and watch Goldfinger, despite some problematic moments in both of those films as well. Yeah. Um, I, I would send them that way. So, but I, I agree with what you said, Cam. And much like some of the other ones we've done in the past, I always go back to The Man from Uncle, but there's plenty of other ones uh, that we've enjoyed, but have not quite made it. They've been close, but not quite there. And I think it's joining the that list, if there ever was one. The, the almost knock list, but not quite. Of the uh, zeitgeisty spy action movies of this particular era which do you prefer triple x or charlie's angels i have more fun with charlie's angels yeah like i think charlie's angels i would slightly side with and that has a lot to do with pace i think charlie's angels is just on rails for like 95 minutes it, it's a lot punchier and i think i like the leads more mm -hmm. I, I i could spend hours with um you know drew and uh, cameron and lucy they're not interested in spending those hours with you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> but I keep writing them and they don't reply. Why won't they reply? <sighs> I just want to be an angel, Ken. <laughs> Th throw your hands up at me. <laughs> <laughs> One, nothing wrong with me. Um, uh, well, there you go, folks. It sounds like it's two no's and as such... Triple X is not making the knock list and the dossier on the film is complete and filed as classified. I'm really fascinated to tackle these sequels, I have to say, before we move on. Yeah, me too. Like, I've not seen them. I've not seen them. And I just have like this film was such an of its moment thing. But they, he comes back in like, is it 2016, the return of Xander Cage? 2017. Sure. Like, what does that what does that look like? What does the X Games hero the, the 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 jesus of the x games look like in 2017 well i know the answer to that and i look forward to, to discussing <laughs> it with you later down the road <laughs> is it bloated is the answer bloated no it's it's a crazy movie it'll be interesting one to, to talk about okay well speaking of movies cam what are we doing next week <laughs> a little bit of a change of pace <laughs> we are doing 1988's little nikita starring sydney poitier I know nothing about this movie. This is a Scott pick. We like to work in spy films that we aren't really that familiar with. That's the case with this one. So I can't wait to find out what all the, mm, not the lot, not much fuss, but I just can't wait to find out what it's all about. <laughs> I've never seen a film with River Phoenix in it. You've never seen Indiana Jones in the last crusade. Was he in that? Yeah. He plays young Indiana Jones. What for like five minutes. It's like the first like ten minute opening sequence, yeah. I I have never seen more than ten minutes of a River Phoenix film. Can you pedantic bastard? <laughs> um, so I, I I know there's somewhat of a tragic story behind him. So I, I've never really explored it. I'm looking forward to sort of finding out more about him and, and what he contributed to uh, to film history. Yeah, yeah, this is going to be an interesting one to delve into for sure. But you know, another thing we've got going on at the moment, which you heard of at the beginning of the show, is we've just launched our Patreon. And um, you know, thank you everyone who's jumped on so far. But you know, Cam, what have we tackled so far, and what have we got coming up? Yeah, so we've got our Agent in the Field series, which is looking at movies starring you know spy icon actors or directed by people that made incredible spy films. So we went out of the gate with The Rock, obviously starring Sean Connery, and we have a new episode on The Sting the 1970s classic starring Robert Redford, who's a spy icon, Paul Newman, who's a spy icon, Robert Shaw, who's a spy icon, and from the director of The Little Drummer Girl. <laughs> that'll, that'll hook him in, Cam. That'll hook That's him right. in. That's right. And if you want to hear more about the Patreon, we have some you know really accessible tiers and raise uh, and ways of funding the show and, and showing your support and you can find out more about that at patreon.com slash spy hards that's s-p-y-h-a-r-d-s and we'll also have a link down in the show notes below 
So your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to watch Little Nikita and join us next week. You can, of course, find out more about the knock list on letterbox.com slash spyhards. And we are a proud member of Quite the Thing and Podbreed Podcast Networks. Don't forget to, of course, follow us discreetly on social media at spyhards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, moral is don't be a dick, dick. <laughs>